Greetings, salam, shakumaku. How are you, dear listeners? Podcasting from the old railway depot in Swamp Poodle, Washington, D.C., welcome to Iraq Matters, an epic podcast of ideas, news, and conversations about Iraq and about Americans who have Iraq in their story. Whether you're tuning in from Baghdad or Washington, D.C., Vancouver or London, or the places in between, this podcast is for you. Hada lakum. Over the past 14 years, Epic has touched many lives, and we're creating this podcast to share those connections and stories with the wider audience, and to build a community of support for humanitarianism and peace in Iraq. This is Epic's first podcast, and I'm very happy to have you joining us at the very beginning. So what's Epic? The Education for Peace in Iraq Center is an independent 501c3 charitable organization founded by concerned Americans in 1998. We work to advance peace, humanitarian relief, and democracy in Iraq. So a bit more about this podcast. Today, we live in a world where the distance between people around the globe is closing fast. A world where events thousands of miles away can touch and affect our lives here, or where events and decisions made here can affect lives half a world away. Our goal is to deliver timely, original content about matters of consequence in Iraq, about current U.S.-Iraq policy, and about what needs to change to build a brighter tomorrow. We also aim to share timeless stories about Iraq's history, natural heritage, culture, and trends. After all, Iraq is not Las Vegas. What happens in Iraq does not stay in Iraq. From the birth of Abraham to tales from a thousand and one Arabian nights, to more recent events of what's happening in the region today. Iraq matters. And the more you know, the richer you are for it. Finally, with escalating violence in Iraq and the Syrian civil war at a time when many in Washington are turning away and seeking to cut U.S. funding for international development, we seek to raise awareness about an ongoing humanitarian emergency where the U.S. and the international community can make a vital difference that saves lives. We plan to release a podcast at least twice a month with each episode including a guest interview, an Iraq update, and rotating segments on life and culture, book, movie, and music reviews, what's trending with Iraqi youth, and a spotlight on people and organizations making a difference. In today's podcast, we receive an Iraq update from Joe Wing, a longtime Iraq watcher. Virtually everyone I know who cares about Iraq has at one time or another spent time reading Joe's musings on Iraq. Then we interview my friend Ahmed Ali, an Iraq-born analyst at the Institute for the Study of War, a think tank here in Washington, D.C. The interview is divided into two parts, starting with the conversation about Iraqi politics and what's up with Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. In today's Culture Corner, we talk with Zainab al of American Islamic Congress about what Ramadan means and how it's celebrated in her former hometown, Iraq's southern port city of Basra. In part two of our guest interview with Ahmed Ali, we look at what's behind the recent escalation of violence and what ought to be done about it. So let's get this first show on the road. Here's an update from Epic Summer of Peace campaign coordinator, Leslie Harkins. Thanks, Eric. Here at Epic, we're campaigning to put Iraq back on the agenda. We've launched a petition on Change.org, which to date has secured the support of 2,700 people like you. You can sign and share our campaign at IraqMatters.org. So why are we doing this campaign? The UN reports that in July, violence claimed the lives of 1,057 Iraqis and wounded another 2,326, the worst violence seen in more than five years. More than 3 million Iraqis remain displaced, adding to a regional humanitarian crisis that includes 5.9 million displaced Syrians. That crisis has triggered the largest UNHCR appeal ever issued in history. To date, only 37% of that appeal has been funded. Today is Tuesday, August 6th. It has been 603 days since President Barack Obama last met with Iraq's Prime Minister and last made any public statement about an ongoing U.S. commitment to the people of Iraq. The President's fiscal year 2014 budget proposes 70 to 95 percent cuts in U.S. funding for Iraqi peacebuilding, human rights, and civil society. Join us in urging President Obama and Congress to do more to support strong humanitarian action and diplomacy for a more peaceful Iraq. You can join our growing community of supporters at IraqMatters.org. Shukran, listeners. And now to you, David. Mm-hmm. 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. In today's Iraq update, we have Joel Wing. Hi, how's it going? So uh, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, so obviously what's gained headlines today and what's really in the news about Iraq is the escalating violence in the country. You recently had an attack upon two prisons in the Baghdad province by al-Qaeda in Iraq, which showed you how effective and how deadly the insurgents are. Uh, you had this basically a huge attack upon these two prisons that involve suicide bombers, car bombers, uh, mortars, RPGs. It's just a really well-planned and executed attack. They think <laughs> one attack on the Taji prison was sort of a delay, or I'm not delay, uh, uh, try to get people to focus there, and the main attack was upon the Abu Ghraib prison. They think anywhere from 500 to maybe 1,500 prisoners escaped, uh, most of which were al-Qaeda operatives. They think the minister of war, for example, was one of the people who escaped, and it's just this huge scandal within Iraq. The, that day the attack happened, for example, the, the Iraqi government-sponsored TV didn't even mention it for a long time. Um, there's all these recriminations about who's responsible, uh, what's that say about the security forces, what's that says about the government. So that was probably just a sign of what's going on. And then also, since it's the end of the month, uh, all the organizations that track Iraqi deaths released their numbers, and all of them went up. Uh, the United Nations had over a thousand people dead in the country. It's the first time it's reached that thousand mark for a really long time. Um, same thing. Even the Iraqi government, which always has the lowest casualty figures, had 989 people killed for July, which was even higher than Iraq body count, which usually is considered the really reliable source. So you've got the prison attack, which is a sign of how violence is escalating, the insurgency is making a comeback in the country. So that was probably the biggest thing that happened this month in Iraq. Two other important events that have been happening in Iraq is that there's electricity protests that are spreading to southern Iraq. Started in Nazaria in June. People are complaining it's the summertime. The weather, you know, goes up to 120 degrees or more in Iraq, especially in the south where it's hotter than other parts in the country. And there's just continued power shortages, power outages. This is the third time in four years that people have come out in the streets in Iraq complaining about the power situation. And it's just spreading throughout the south. So it started in Dikar and then it spread to Basra, Misan, Wazit, Dana. All these big cities are all having protests against the government. And it's coming at a bad time because right now the government is facing Sunni protests. It's facing the renewed insurgency and now people in the south, which is the base for the Shia religious parties, they're coming out in the street. So everybody's blaming each other. Maliki, the prime minister, has blamed his, uh, his deputy, Sharistani, who's in charge of the energy sector. Sharistani said, it's not me. I don't really, you know, in charge of energy. I just do planning. Um, the electricity ministry blames the oil ministry and the finance ministry. Everybody's blaming each other. Uh, it's a really big issue because the government really doesn't need another problem. Uh, another thing that also recently happened is that uh, the last two provincial councils were just formed. Uh, this year you had elections across most of the country for the new government councils, and the last two were just formed in Ambar. You had basically an anti maliki coalition coming to power there. Um, and then also in Nineveh, the governor Nujafi was able to stay in power, although this time he had to form an alliance with the Kurds. So basically all the provinces that had elections, they now have new provincial governments. And they've all promised, oh, we're going to do services, we're going to be much better than the old people. And there's already problems with some of these new governments. So those are basically the three main things that have happened this month. You've had huge increase in violence. You've had protests spread through southern Iraq against the shortage of electricity. And you've had the last provincial government formed. And that's basically the main things that happened this month. Thank you, Joel. And now part one of our guest interview with Ahmed Ali. Hello, this is Eric Gustafson, the director at EPIC. I'm here with David Slater, an Iraq war veteran who's uh, with our summer team here at EPIC. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest today, Ahmed Ali, who is a research analyst at the Institute for the Study of War. What led you to become a policy analyst on Iraq? 
Mostly my uh, interest uh, in the country. I uh, know a great deal about the country. I'm uh, from there. I uh, lived and traveled in uh, much uh, of Iraq's 18 provinces. Uh, that uh, enabled me to have a good understanding of the situation in Iraq uh, and also my linguistic capabilities uh, uh, made and still make my job uh, very easy since I speak Arabic and I speak Kurdish. So why does Iraq matter? Uh, from a policy perspective, Iraq uh, matters for uh, three simple reasons. Uh, first of all, if you look at the map of the Middle East, uh, you see Iraq in the middle of the Middle East. Uh, it is in the heart of the Middle East. Uh, second, because of that location, it borders two uh, rising powers and uh, superpowers in the Middle East, and that is uh, Iran and Turkey. Third, uh, Iraq has uh, always played a leading role in the Middle East, and uh, it has sought to use the geographic location, proximity to uh, these two nations, and also the oil resources for uh, its own uh, po uh, foreign policy or regional policy. Uh, therefore, it's a very important country and uh, one that uh, other countries in the Middle East uh, look to, whether to get uh, inspiration or in some cases uh, try to learn uh, lessons uh, about what not to do for their own countries. Plus, it's a diverse country. Uh, it's one of the most diverse countries in the Middle East, and uh, that offers it uh, the, uh, the ability to influence events in, uh, in the region. Ahmed, how does the government get formed? Uh, Iraq's p political system is different to the one uh, that exists in the United States. Uh, first of all, there is no direct elections of the executive branch. Uh, so uh, there aren't uh, five candidates who run for the presidency and then uh, the people will vote for, the, for those individuals and put them in office. It is a parliamentary system. So when elections do take place, you have hundreds of uh, parties competing and uh, they try to get as many seats in the parliament as possible because the higher the number of seats you have, the better your opportunity is to form a government. Once elections are done, if there is a, a clear winner in the elections, uh, and by a clear winner I mean somebody who has the 50 plus one inside the parliament, uh, which makes it the absolute majority, that bloc can vote for the prime minister, uh, and the members of the parliament will vote for the prime minister. In general though, what we have seen in Iraq since 2005 is that there has uh, not been a single party or a single group uh, that was able to go up beyond that threshold and form the government on its own. Uh, it has always had to uh, be about negotiations. So then these political parties must team up with one another to create some sort of coalition or a bloc? That is the uh, main theme of uh, government formation in Iraq, which is uh, coalition building and uh, negotiations and uh, trying to meet the interest of uh, every group that wants to be part of the government. Okay. And regarding the provincial governments, how does the provincial government relate to the national government? Is it something similar here to the United States, how we have the federal government and the state government? By law, it should be uh, very similar, but uh, Iraq has uh, traditionally been a very centralized system uh, in which uh, Baghdad as a capital and the government in Baghdad uh, has a great deal of uh, say, great deal of influence in provincial affairs. So the idea of uh, provincial governance is uh, a new idea in Iraq. It's in uh, its infancy stage, uh, and it started in uh, 2005. That, because of the legacy of centralization in Iraq, provincial governments have not been uh, able to operate uh, as uh, state governments do here uh, in the United States. The central government uh, always seeks to uh, uh, get as much influence as possible over the provincial governments. And it does, uh, uh, the fact that you have provincial governments also raises questions about the quality of those provincial governments. In uh, many cases, the provincial uh, governor, uh, governments and officials are uh, not in a good training, uh, training stage. Uh, they're still getting used to the idea of governing themselves. But uh, uh, by law, uh, provincial governments are, uh, so have to be independent uh, when it comes to managing their own affairs, electing their own governor. But in practice, uh, that is not the case. In Egypt, politics are often described as a rivalry between secularists and Islamists. In comparison, how would you describe Iraqi politics? It's uh, different because uh, the 
majority of uh, the major political parties are uh, Islamist parties. So the competition, not about um, who is more uh, anti-secularism uh, in the country. It, it is about political competition, it is about uh, personalities, because even on the Iraqi uh, Sunni political side, religiosity is uh, still an important theme. Very uh, few political parties are uh, willing to publicly and openly uh, campaign on a secularist platform. Uh, the idea is not there yet. I remember in uh, 2011, when the Arab Spring had hit the rest of the Arab world, there were some protests going on in Iraq. And Prime Minister Maliki said that he would give up half of his paycheck as well as he wouldn't run in 2014. Do you think that this is actually going to happen, that he's going to listen to the people? Yeah, I think I mean, we are just talking about provincial governments. And the 2011 uh, protests are a great example of provincial governments and the responsibilities they have and the uh, accountability that voters want to see from them. Because when they took place, uh, when the didn't, February, didn't February, the governor stepped down? That's correct. And uh, that was the result of uh, pressure from the population of the local governments. Uh, it wasn't uh, on uh, Prime Minister Maliki in all cases. Uh, in many cases, the pressure was on, a, on the governor of the province, is that you are not delivering. You promised us services but you're not delivering so you have you have to get out uh, so it has it has created a sense of local politics as far as prime minister mark is concerned for 2014 there is nothing in the constitution that says he cannot run uh, the iraqi system does not have a term limit for the prime minister so if he wants to run and he has shown ambition and uh, he has stated many times that uh, or him or people close to him that they would like to run uh, and they would like to see him as prime minister he he has a legal uh, pretext to do it but uh, it depends on the other political parties uh, and as i said uh, it is about negotiations uh, so he has to be successful in convincing all the uh, other political parties to support him uh, to be prime minister again this might change if Prime Minister Maliki and his group are able to uh, uh, secure uh, the absolute majority in the parliament uh, through election results. Uh, and that's why I believe the 2014 elections will be uh, uh, very important uh, for Prime Minister Maliki himself and for the direction of the country. You've been following Iraqi politics for a long time, and you've been talking about Prime Minister Maliki and other major actors. Can you just break it down for our listeners? Who are the major players, uh, both personalities and major political parties? Uh, for personalities, Prime Minister Maliki is by all means the most dominant personality in Iraqi politics. Uh, he has been uh, Prime Minister for uh, seven years. Uh, he has been able to consolidate power to a great extent, and he has uh, a great deal of influence. He also does have popularity uh, within the country. If we uh, look at the 2010 elections, which was the last time he competed personally, he was able to receive uh, 624,000 votes in Baghdad, where he ran, which was the highest any politician in the country received. So he is one of the most dominant personalities. Then uh, the Speaker of the Council of, the, of Representatives, which is the Iraqi Parliament, uh, Osama Najafi, is also uh, an important personality. Uh, he has been able to uh, use office to project uh, an image of uh, a statesman and uh, a leader of his community, which is the uh, Iraqi Sunni community. And he is uh, normally very critical of uh, Prime Minister Maliki and uh, always uh, points out that Prime Minister Maliki's consolidation of power is uh, not in the interest of the country and uh, it's not positive for the future of the country. So we can consider him. And, the, and now um, Al Nujayfi is with, had ran with the Iraqiya or part of the Iraqiya coalition and then Prime Minister Maliki was with the Dawa party, is that correct? Uh, that, that's correct. Uh, you know, uh, Speaker Nujayfi was uh, part of Iraqiya in the 2010 elections. Uh, and Prime Minister Maliki was uh, part of uh, what was called the State of Law Alliance, the SLA. 
and it's an umbrella uh, alliance of uh, different groups but Prime Minister Maliki is with the Da'wah party uh, and the Da'wah party is uh, an uh, Islamist uh, by nature uh, it's an Iraqi uh, Shia party, one that has uh, deep roots in uh, Iraq society, one of the oldest uh, Iraqi political parties within the different communities. But in terms of other personalities, of course, you have the president of Iraq, Kurdistan, President Masoud Barzani. He's a very important personality. The current president of Iraq, Jalal Talabani, is also an important personality, although he's uh, in uh, Germany at the moment uh, receiving treatment from a stroke that he had, but he's also very influential. The leader of Iraqiya, Ayad Alawi, he's a former prime minister and secular figure in the country. Uh, so these are the personalities, but for groups, you have a number of uh, major groups. Uh, we already discussed the State of Law Alliance led mm -hmm. by Prime Minister Maliki. Uh, it has an Iraqi Shia orientation. Also within the Iraqi Shia uh, political sphere, uh, you have the Sadrist uh, trend uh, led by uh, Muqtada Sadr. Uh, it's, all, it's a significant group that has grassroots support. And then uh, you have uh, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, which was very dominant before 2010, but has suffered a number of uh, setbacks since then. Uh, within the Iraq Sunni community, um, it's much more fragmented uh, than the Iraq Shia community. Uh, it is about uh, personalities, uh, so uh, Speaker Nujafi is uh, influential and his group uh, that's known as uh, Muttahidun, uh, the United is uh, a major player in, in the Iraq political scene and uh, you also have um, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Saleh Al-Mutlaq uh, who has a significant political group uh, called the uh, Dialogue Front. Um, and then you have other other groups, uh, but uh, for the Iraqi uh, Sunni uh, groups, uh, a lot of the political influence is uh, regional and uh, personality based, mm -hmm. uh, unlike the Iraqi Shia political groups, which have much more uh, bigger of uh, platform and uh, also uh, constituents. Uh, for the Iraqi Kurds, you have three uh, major groups, uh, and that is the Kurdistan Democratic Party, the KDP, and uh, the Patriotic Union of uh, Kurdistan, uh, the PUK, and there's also what's known as the Change Movement, uh, Goran, which is uh, has which has become a major player uh, starting in 2009 in Iraqi Kurdish politics. And of course, you have other opposition groups or uh, primarily Islamist groups uh, inside of inside Iraqi Kurdistan. Okay, recently, Prime Minister Maliki had reached out to the Sunnis and also the Kurds. Do you think this is an attempt, his attempt, in order to help reunify Iraq? The outreach by Prime Minister Maliki is uh, something that he uh, does every once in a while. Uh, he especially does it when he uh, feels uh, uh, weakened uh, to an extent. And uh, we saw that take place uh, this year after the provincial elections. Uh, when uh, Prime Minister Maliki and uh, his group did not uh, do very well uh, when concerns uh, government formation. So it's a strategy and a tactic on his part to uh, recover uh, and uh, get some of his uh, strength back. Could it, is, it, could it possibly be a reaction to what Hakim is doing? Because it seems that you said in one of your reports that Hakim has been reaching out to the tribes. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I'm glad you, you mentioned the report, and I would uh, encourage uh, the audience to uh, go, go read it at uh, our website. But, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let, just for the audience, Hakim is the leader of the Islamic Supreme Council in Iraq. Correct, correct. Uh, and that's, that's Iski. But uh, Prime Minister Mike at the moment doesn't necessarily uh, do things because, uh, uh, you know, Ammar al-Hakim is uh, following that strategy or Muqtad al-Sadr is following that strategy. He is uh, refocusing his effort for the 2014 elections, and uh, he wants to uh, ensure that he can have a viable uh, opportunity uh, for the next elections, whether to be a prime minister himself or to uh, uh, ensure he has influence in government formation.
That was part one of our conversation with Ahmed Ali. In part two, we look at what's behind the recent escalation of violence in Iraq. But first, today's Culture Corner. David talks with an old friend of mine, Zainab al Sawaj of the American Islamic Congress. She's the executive director there, and she is from Basra. She'll be talking about the meaning of Ramadan and how it's celebrated in Iraq. Zainab, what is Ramadan? Ramadan is the month of fasting uh, for um, Muslims. Uh, it falls as the seventh month of the year, and uh, it's 30 days of uh, fasting. People fast from sunrise to sunset. And um, during that uh, time, they were not able to eat or drink anything. It's a month that people remember people who are poor and needy and they cannot eat and uh, also a month of reflection and spirituality. People pray more and it's a month of reflection and reflect on what they have done and how to become better uh, individuals in, uh, uh, in life. Okay. Is there anything that the American Islamic Congress is doing currently for Ramadan? Well, we are uh, the American Islamic Congress giving uh, iftars. And our theme this year, uh, Iftar from around the world. And every week we pick a theme, how to celebrate Ramadan in Africa or in Asia or in Europe, in America, in um, uh, Far East, in Australia. And so every every week we have a different theme on, on celebrating Ramadan and educating people about the culture of that, these specific areas and how people celebrate Ramadan in these areas. Uh, would you be able to describe to me how people celebrate Ramadan in your native country of Iraq? Well, uh, of course, the, they start with uh, basically fasting uh, during the day, and reading a lot of Quran and prayers. And um, they go to work and they have their normal day. And then before breaking fast, um, the whole family gather to cook food. Uh, to that, you know, the neighbors bring you food from, you know, different neighbors and they cook something and they say, well, we share it with our neighbor. Um, after uh, breaking fast, people, um, you know, people when they break their fast, they start with dates. And uh, so the dates are mandatory on the table and then several other dishes that they are, you know, uh, eat specifically in this month. And um, then after the finished breaking fast, then they start the prayers and visiting e each other um, uh, and uh, celebrate the month. Uh, the month starts with congratulating the first week. And then after that, well, um, we have uh, a special uh, um, occasions in, in the 15th of the month when uh, the kids go around from one house to the other asking for, um, you know, uh, candy. It reminds me of Halloween here in the U.S. So uh, the kids uh, just uh, dress up and they have their own bags and they go to ask for candy from, and they have songs that associate with these, uh, with these kind of asking. So they tour their, their neighborhoods and families prepare the candy and goodies for them to, mm. to take and go. And, and when exactly was that? The 15th, uh, on the 15th night of Ramadan. Okay. And um, after that, uh, of course, it can be, uh, it depends where, where you are in the country or what, uh, which group you follow. So you have the last 10 days of Ramadan, which is considered, which is considered the holiest. And then you have the Kadr nights, which is uh, three nights or four nights in, in Ramadan that are considered very holy and uh, people... Spent the whole night until morning basically praying and reading prayers and uh, doing rituals and stuff like that. And then the night, people also remember the, uh, the members of family who passed away, um, uh, you know, by uh, giving out food or goods to the poor people and stuff like that. At the same time, after, uh, before uh, the Eid night, uh, which is the uh, first day of, uh, after Ramadan, first day of celebration and feast. So uh, women and, and kids make um, uh, cookies for, for aid. 
and this is a white common um, like a uh, widely um, uh, separate tradition that the night before people make all of these cookies and so the whole family participate in making cookies and so um, the event so as they, a whole is just a, it's a big family get together? Get together to bake cookies and uh, baking of the cookies so they can offer it to their guests uh, during the celebration the days after after Ramadan, like the first three days after Ramadan when people celebrate and, uh, and share these things with their own friends and family members and so on. Mm-hmm. Wow, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> it is fun uh, despite the, uh, you know, the long days of Ramadan and the heat and all of that, but it's, it's always rewarding, you know, right. uh, what, to participate in it. What's it like celebrating Ramadan during the summer when the days are especially long? Well, this is uh, certainly extra, the extra heat gives you more, um, you know, will withdraw the energy from your body. So, um, and most of the time it's really hot. Uh, sometimes the heat is like 120, 25 degrees and uh, people just to be more hungry, more not even hunger more than um, being thirsty during the, the day. Uh, but, uh, you know, all of these things, they forget about the long days and the, and the hardship, you know, the time they break their fast and then the whole people keep eating and drinking all night until almost sunrise. And uh, you're from Basra, correct? That's right. So Basra is even hotter than the re- other parts of Iraq. That's right. So that must have been especially tough during the It is very difficult, very difficult, very difficult to, uh, very humid and very hot and uh, sometimes people are hot. Uh, you know, fasting there is not that easy. Right. And I guess my uh, final question for you is, how has Ramadan changed over the years? Well, so many things have, have changed. Uh, before, um, you see, things are much more simple, now it's more, you know, sophisticated. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, most of like prayers, for example, people go to the mosque and pray and so on and hear it. In the, now you, people can watch it on TV or on, hear it on the internet or on their smartphones. So things have changed in that way, especially when technology uh, improved and so on. Um, so that's one. The other thing is uh, you see people are, I'd say, much more into... Um, you know, there's so much more into the um, uh, family and so on. But at the same time, these these kind of visits and so on after after breaking fast become less and less in recent years because of people are busy. They go to work and this and that, so it gives them less time to even celebrate this month to the to the max. In recent years, also, they uh, that work time have changed. Uh, work hours are been reduced. When it's really hot, uh, the government give uh, a holiday for uh, people not to to go to work. And uh, also, what have changed is like there is less electricity than before, so that makes the days even longer, and the heat is really bad and effect very effective on people. Mm. So there are some some positive changes and some negative changes as well. Wow. Yeah, I I can't imagine you know being down in Basra or anywhere in Iraq for that matter not having the the AC going and you're exactly you're fasting and you're you're hungry sure. so that that really to me shows a lot of personal willpower you of know. course and dedication to the, the cause right well thank you very much for joining us Zainab my pleasure thank you very much and I wish you all the best thank you. and you as well thanks bye bye Thanks again, Zainab. To all of our Muslim listeners, Ramadan Mubarak and Eid Sa'id. We'd also like to put a special shout out to Yahe Al Abdeli and all the folks who have made TEDx Baghdad, TEDx Erbil, TEDx Youth at Baghdad successes. We're extremely excited about this inspiring, pioneering work to spread great ideas throughout Iraqi society. We now go to part two of our interview with Ahmed Ali.
since April, we have seen levels of violence in Iraq not seen in more than five years. What are the major drivers of violent conflict in Iraq today, and what's behind the recent escalation? Um, the groups that were very uh, operational and very uh, active uh, in 2005, 2006, uh, such as uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, and other uh, insurgent groups are resurgent in Iraq at the moment. Uh, so uh, there are many attacks uh, inside the country that uh, are easily attributable to AQI uh, because they have the hallmark of uh, that organization. Uh, they include car bombs and attacks by uh, improvised uh, explosive devices, uh, IEDs, in uh, many cases, uh, they are intended to target uh, Iraqi Shia civilians uh, in order to trigger, trigger a response from uh, the Iraqi Shia militias and essentially create the scenario uh, that took place before uh, the beginning of Iraq's civil war in 2006. Therefore, the levels of violence that we see in Iraq uh, since April of this year have been the highest <coughs> since uh, June of 2008, especially uh, May. Well, you, you mentioned that Al-Qaeda is part of it. How much is the violence in Syria a factor? Uh, for Al-Qaeda in Iraq, they are very re-energized by the uh, fight in Syria. Uh, they are directly involved. Uh, they have uh, set up uh, bases inside of uh, Syria itself. And, uh, and is that uh, Al Nusra Front? Is that one of the major? Uh, they are. Uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq is a competitor to Al Nusra Front. Uh, okay. Al Qaeda in Iraq has its own franchise. It's known as Al Qaeda in Iraq and uh, Bilad al Sham in Arabic. Uh, in other words, Al Qaeda in Iraq and the Levant. ISIS uh, is the name for it. Uh, so Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, is very involved in Syria and they are able to uh, launch attacks in Iraq at their own pace. Uh, in other words, they seize, uh, they seize the initiative uh, and the security forces uh, so far uh, in Iraq are not able to uh, contain the threat and the operational capability that uh, AQI uh, represents. Over the years when we've seen Al-Qaeda operations in Iraq, the attacks have been deliberately provocative to try to draw other communities into really a, a civil war, an all-out civil war. And um, one thinks of the bombing of the shrine um, in Samarra as an example of that. Recently, there were two attacks. One was a tea shop in Karbala, killing many young people and, and elderly folks, um, as you know, tea shops are as popular as coffee houses here in the United States. And then there was an attack on uh, Sunni Muslims just shortly after breaking the fast outside a mosque in Baghdad. Do we know who was behind these attacks? Um, are we already seeing tit-for-tat attacks where al-Qaeda carries out an attack and then it's answered by one of the extremist Shia militias? Well, the attacks on uh, cafes uh, and you know, tea shops in uh, Iraq are easily uh, attributable. Uh, many of them, uh, I would say the majority of them, uh, are attributable, attributable to uh, AQI. There are uh, reports that AQI doesn't want the youth to uh, congregate uh, in tea shops and uh, spend their time uh, doing things that uh, AQI describes as uh, worldly amusement, worldly. Uh, yeah. not go, not going out and embracing uh, what AQI embraces, which mm. is uh, extremism and the use of violence to achieve political means. That's why you see uh, targeting of uh, cafes and uh, and tea shops in uh, various places uh, in the country, uh, in some Iraqi Shia communities or uh, others in predominantly Iraqi Sunni communities. The concept and the possibility of retaliatory attacks uh, can never be uh, ruled out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did see, in uh, starting in mid-May until late uh, May of this year, uh, increased activities by uh, Iraqi Shia militias, uh, primarily in Baghdad at this point, but it hasn't been uh, on a large scale as uh, AQI attacks have been. In a recent document which you published on your website, dated May 31st, 
you say that Muqtada Sadr on May 21st issued a statement in which he urged his followers to ostracize extremism and um, basically retaliatory attacks. If Sadr is not ordering his militia and those who follow him to retaliate, who exactly are retaliating against Al-Qaeda? Well, you have uh, a number of uh, Iraq Shia militias. Uh, Muqtada Sadr uh, has uh, his own militia. Uh, it's called the Promise Day Brigade, uh, which is essentially the Mahdi uh, army uh, that was uh, established in 2003. And then uh, you have another group known as uh, Asaib Ahl al-Haq in Arabic, uh, or League of the Righteous in English, and the acronym for it is uh, AAH. Then you have a, another group, uh, another group named uh, Kitab Hezbollah, the Hezbollah Brigades, and the acronym for it is uh, KH. KH is uh, not involved in internal uh, militant activities a great deal. Uh, it operates mostly outside of the country. Uh, AH, on the other hand, uh, is very much uh, involved in uh, militia activities inside the country. And uh, when we uh, saw the reactivation and remobilization of uh, militias in Iraq uh, this year, AAH was uh, a major uh, player in that effort. And uh, the, the Promise Day Brigade uh, was not uh, as involved, but uh, uh, there is a competition among the Iraq Shia parties to uh, appear as the defenders of the community and the defenders of, uh, of the Shia. Uh, so the statement that you referred to by uh, Muqtada Sadr uh, was an attempt by him to show that he is also a defender of the Shia in uh, face of uh, these AQI attacks. I think the worst part about the retaliatory attacks is that it's often against quote-unquote soft targets. So the retaliation isn't against al-Qaeda directly, it's against you know, the Sunni Muslim community and vice versa. Al-Qaeda will make attacks against unarmed Shia and often mm. in poor communities because mm. they're easier to carry out, you know, these mass casualty bombings. That, that's a correct as assessment. And what is important to understand about the Iraq Shia militias is that they have not disarmed. Uh, they still have the same arms uh, that they had. Uh, they have not uh, demobilized, uh, so the members are still uh, member uh, active and ready to be uh, to be remobilized at any moment. For all 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 the Iraq Shia militias, uh, Muqtada Sadr's Promise Day Brigade and the uh, AAH as well. So Ahmed, in uh, in your opinion, what exactly needs to happen in order to end this current violence which has been sweeping through Iraq? Uh, it begins with reviewing the security uh, procedures that the Iraq security forces follow. Uh, the Iraq security forces or the ISF uh, are not uh, proactive force, uh, as uh, as you know, David. You, uh, you you're 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 a war veteran. The Iraq security forces does not conduct preemptive uh, operations to disrupt uh, any possible attacks. Are they uh, allowed to? Because I remember. Previously, Maliki had disallowed operations against Shia militias. Is this still the case? Uh, it could be the case in some uh, in some uh, situations, but uh, and the doctrine of the Iraqi military is uh, not one that uh, pushes you to go out and conduct operations. That's not the way the Iraqi military works. The Iraqi military is uh, reactionary. Uh, it's very reactionary. It it reacts to events, and sometimes the reaction is fruitful, and it will result in arresting possible perpetrators of attacks. Uh, sometimes it's discriminatory. Uh, it's just about uh, surrounding an area and uh, rounding up any possible suspects. But it's it's also based on uh, checkpoints uh, and. Uh, stationary checkpoints, not uh, moving checkpoints as uh, the U.S. military had. Uh, if that doctrine doesn't change, militant groups, uh, Iraq Shia militias or AQI and other groups will continue to be able to carry out attacks. So it begins from uh, that practical aspect. Then it has to do with the politics of the country as well because you do have a segment of the population that is the Iraqi Sunnis uh, who feel uh, marginalized. Uh, they perceive Baghdad, as, uh, and especially uh, Prime Minister Maliki, as uh, treating them uh, unfairly and tar targeting them politically. And 
politics and security in Iraq are uh, often linked. Uh, so unless some political solutions are provided, the security solutions uh, might not work. Uh, they have to go hand in hand. What makes you hopeful about Iraq's future? It has to be said that looking at the trends uh, with regards to security, with uh, regards to uh, politics, uh, it is uh, difficult to, uh, to be uh, hopeful. I think uh, pessimism is uh, warranted. Uh, the country is not uh, going through internal, internal uh, positive developments in, in many ways, but uh, you see tendencies sometimes by Iraq political parties uh, to reach uh, across the aisle, so to speak, and uh, form cross-sectarian uh, coalitions. If that takes place, that will be a, a positive development. However, uh, there has to be uh, a waiting period until the uh, post-election period in 2014 to see if that will uh, take place. The overall trajectory of the country, though, is uh, worrying and uh, is concerning uh, for Iraqis and has to be concerning for uh, the international community. And do you think there's something that the United States um, and international community could do to better encourage that kind of um, coalition building and governing more for the sake of all Iraqis? There's also a role to be played, but that role has to be used uh, wisely and uh, only when uh, um, the Iraqi political parties uh, will uh, need a, a mediator and an honest broker. Uh, that's when the uh, international community, including the United States, can uh, step in and uh, ensure that political disagreements don't turn into uh, violent disagreements. Well, thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, it's been wonderful talking with you, and um, we should let our listeners know that they can follow Ahmed on Twitter um, at Iraq Shamel, S H A M E L, and uh, you can also keep up with his updates at the Institute for the Study of War. Um, his um, Iraq updates are really among the best for someone who's able to cover the region, not just um, in terms of the English press, but also the Arabic press, the Iraqi press, and other languages too, I understand. So um, thank you so much for being with us today, Ahmed. Thank you for having me. This has been Iraq Matters, an epic podcast of news, ideas, and conversations about Iraq for listeners like you. Thank you so much for joining us. For this, our first podcast, we would like to thank our special guests, Zainab Al-Sawaj of the American Islamic Congress, Joel Wing of the blog Musings on Iraq, and Ahmed Ali of the Institute for the Study of War. Shukran. This podcast series was conceived and created by Epic's exceptional team of interns. Special thanks to Leslie Harkins and David Slater for arranging and interviewing our guests and for all of their hard work on editing and producing this podcast. Finally, a word about the music you've been hearing. Opening and closing this program, you've been hearing the iconic song, Faganacho, which translates to On Top of the Palm Tree by Iraq's legendary singer, Nazem Al-Ghazali. Between segments, you've been hearing Rahim al Haj's hauntingly beautiful title track from his 2002 album, The Second Baghdad, available on iTunes and at CD Baby. Now, we want to hear from you. As our very first episode, your feedback and suggestions are not only welcome, they're vital. Tell us what you think. Share your ideas of future topics and guests, or your favorite Iraqi recipe. Please send your emails to iraqmatters at yahoo.com or leave a comment at epic-usa.org slash podcast. This is Epic Director Eric Gustafson reminding you and friends around the world that Iraq matters. <laughs> <laughs>